Roman Catholicism is a tradition often known for its hierarchies, its popes and bishops, its towering cathedrals, its dogmas and rules. But this same tradition also helped make possible the spread of a bottom-up, democratic kind of economy, the cooperative movement, which enables ordinary people around the world to own and govern the businesses they rely on. This film is the story of how Roman Catholicism opened its doors to a radical economic model and how people of faith have worked to build a more just and sustainable society. Pope Francis, in his 2015 encyclical Laudato Si, called the world's attention to the global climate crisis and identified the use of fossil fuels as the main threat to our common home. Another theme in Laudato Si is the recognition that efforts to mitigate the climate crisis should not ignore the plight of the poor nations who are suffering from climate disasters they did not cause. Pope Francis echoes the words of Leonardo Boff, the Brazilian theologian, when he exhorts us to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. With this encyclical, subtitled On Care for Our Common Home, Pope Francis is making a major contribution to the body of Catholic social teaching and adding to the tradition of previous popes. Early in the encyclical, Pope Francis strikes a hopeful note when he says the Creator will not abandon us and never forsakes creation. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. This hopeful declaration heralds a unique theme in Laudato Si. On three occasions in Laudato Si, the Pope encourages the cooperative enterprise as a model for economic development. The cooperative is recommended in paragraphs 112, 179, and lastly in paragraph 180, where Pope Francis concludes with the statement, truly much can be done. In fact, much has been done in the cooperative sector. At least 12% of people on earth belong to one or more of three million cooperatives. And cooperatives provide jobs and work opportunities for 330 million people. The evolution of cooperativism is a global phenomenon with cooperatives in agriculture, manufacturing, financial services like credit unions and insurance, worker-owned co-ops, as well as consumer co-ops in food, goods and services. Co-ops are formed by members of all the world's religious traditions and by people who are avowedly non-religious. Nevertheless, there is a strong Catholic tradition in the evolution of cooperativism. We asked Professor Nathan Schneider, author of Everything for Everyone, about the intersection of Catholic social teaching and cooperatives. The connection between the co-op legacy and, the, and Catholic social teaching is a long one. Uh, modern cooperativism got going in the kind of early to mid 19th century. And um, during those decades and into the 1880s, um, the Catholic Church increase, increasingly recognized it needed to um, address the deep economic problems of that time and came upon, um, at first, not exactly the cooperative tradition, but a lot of the ideas, a lot of the same ideas. So, for instance, in um, uh, the famous encyclical of Leo XIII, the Pope who really jump-started modern Catholic social teaching, he called for the distribution of ownership as a solution to the conflicts of labor and capital, not the communist revolution, not the capitalism for everything, but a kind of distribution of, of ownership. And it turns out that that fit really well with the cooperative movement. So following that, Catholics more and more came into the cooperative movement, saw this as a way of implementing um, the particular solution that, um, that Leo XIII had called for um, in theory, but without a mechanism. The cooperative um, uh, way of doing business became for many people that mechanism. 
this film will investigate a little known aspect of cooperative development, and that is Roman Catholic affinity for the cooperative enterprise. In part one, we will explore the encyclicals that contributed to Catholic involvement in founding cooperatives. And in part two, we will examine the influence of Catholic social teaching on five Roman Catholic priests and one community of women religious, who are responsible for the founding of numerous cooperatives in eastern Nova Scotia, Mondragon, Spain, the Dominican Republic, Panama, and Toronto. The encyclical Rerum Novarum, written in 1891 by Pope Leo XIII, offered a critical analysis of a very modern problem, growing poverty in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, which brought with it horrible living conditions for workers, unsafe workplaces, malnutrition, and child labor. The encyclical is subtitled The Condition of Labor, and in it, Leo XIII cites the root cause of a growing gap between the rich and the poor. Leo XIII believed there was a small group of powerful people who, in his words, maintain their privileges while the needy and the powerless multitude suffer. This is still a problem in the 21st century. In uh, that encyclical, Pope Leo XIII takes on the plight of the workers in factories in Western Europe. This is the time of the Industrial Revolution, and the Pope sees the plight of the workers, their miserable circumstances, the way they are exploited, and, um, and feels that the Catholic Church needs to address that. And that's what he's doing in this encyclical. And in doing so, he is in fact inventing the principles of Catholic social thought. It defends private property and the right to private property. That becomes a principle of Catholic social teaching. It defends subsidiarity, also becomes a principle of Catholic social teaching. That means that it does not want a state-controlled society. It wants a society in which there is openness, where there is a possibility for individual initiatives uh, and freedom in economic matters. So, but on the other hand, pushing back against capitalism, the church defends the right on a decent living wage. Uh, he, it calls it a fair living wage that aligns with the dignity of the human person. Um, so in that kind of thinking about the role of work in human life, in relationship to the dignity of the human person, started with Rerum Novarum. So I think that's why this is such a radical and important encyclical. For a pope to, um, to make a statement recognizing that workers, uh, the, recognizing the dignity of work and workers, um, and I think that that came across in Rerum Novarum. Uh, again, it was kind of framed in, in a, a Eurocentric uh, worldview, but nonetheless, I think, set the stage for, a, you know, a widening recognition of the need for the church to, and popes to state clearly what um, the importance of dignity and work, um, and then expand that to other areas in Catholic social thought. The call that Leo XIII made uh, for expanding ownership, for this, this solution to the problem of labor and capital, um, needed a mechanism, um, needed a, a strategy. It, that wasn't provided in the encyclical. The cooperative movement offered that. Um, it was already up and running in many European countries, um, in the United States and North America and Canada as well. And many people saw that match, saw that the this, this movement of cooperative business, which was developing among diverse religious communities, actually really uniquely fit the, um, uh, the requirements that Catholic social teaching had set out. And as people explored this connection, it just got deeper. So for instance, um, on the one hand, cooperatives democratize ownership. That's very much what Leo XIII called for but they also center education. And so Catholic thinkers started recognizing, oh, this is a way of doing business that isn't just about business, it's about the whole person. This actually does deeply resonate with 
the goals of Catholic social teaching in the sense of of developing the the full person, what what would come to be called a kind of integral humanism, um, and and um, and in that way, this this economic legacy, which came from many different sources, really came to to um, connect in a very deep fashion with um, with Catholic social teaching. And I think that connection is has been not only kind of spiritually and culturally resonant, but also economically. I mean, when you look at the achievements of of Catholics in the cooperative movement, they really stand out in some pretty extraordinary ways, whether you're talking about um, the North American credit union movement, which grew out of uh, the work of Alphonse Desjardins working in the um, Catholic parishes of Quebec, um, to uh, a context like Mondragon, which so many people all over the world for decades have sought to replicate, but no one's really been able to at that scale. There was something really unique about that capacity to connect a deep sense of Catholic social teaching with these economic principles of cooperativism. In 1931, on the 40th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, Pope Pius XI published Quadragesimo Anno, which warns of the dangers of unbridled capitalism as well as totalitarian communism. Whereas Rerum Novarum in 1891 addressed the labor situation in Europe, Quadragesimo Anno was addressed to the whole industrial world. In this 1931 encyclical, Pope Pius XI calls for a third way to achieve economic growth that serves the common good. Three very important themes derived from these encyclicals are the dignity and rights of the person, the principle of solidarity or the right of workers to form associations and community, and subsidiarity, meaning that decisions are made as close as possible to the most local level impacted by them. All three of these principles are found in the cooperative movement. To understand the origins of the modern cooperative movement, we visit the town of Rochdale in northern England in 1844. Here, a group of mill workers who called themselves the Rochdale Pioneers began to plan for a co-op food store that would address the malnutrition from which their families were suffering. It was the, it was the Industrial Revolution. Um, what they were seeing around them in the factory in which they were working and all the other factories where industrialization was was taking place, where the factories were growing to exports from the UK were becoming uh, a major component. What they were seeing was uh, the mill owners uh, using their strength to uh, make sure that the workers only bought their food from them and they were serving them adulterated food, so chalk in their flour, grass in their tea, that as a result, they were all in very poor health. They had to pay the mill owners for their, for their housing. So overall, they were becoming iller, uh, rickets and all sorts of debilitating malnutritional diseases were hitting them. Uh, and these guys decided that there was a better way to live. And so they sat and worked through the values and principles of the movement. And then they, on that basis, which was that, uh, you know, it would be one one person, one vote, and that there would be a democratic control. And they then devised um, a, a shop, um, put together a basic shop, was selling the basic foodstuffs, tea, salt, sugar, uh, very basic elements like butter. And, of course, the food was clean and unadulterated. Uh, and they, they were better. They saw their children and their wives more healthy. Uh, and so that's the, the, the core uh, basis, fundamental basis of the cooperative movement and how it started. The Rochdale principles for cooperatives evolved into the seven principles of cooperativism adopted by the International Cooperative Alliance. They are voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, member economic participation, autonomy and independence of the co-op, education, training and information, cooperation among cooperatives, and concern for community. The values that underlie these principles are consistent with the values of Catholic social teaching. The dignity of the person, the freedom to organize associations, and the right to make important economic decisions at the local level.
the core value of the Rochdale pioneers was the fact that they were the first part of the cooperative movement worldwide to codify the values and principles of cooperation. That's been their, their absolutely fundamental contribution to the growth of the cooperative movement. I think where Catholic social teaching and cooperatives converge is in the marriage of economic justice and um, a deep sense of human flourishing and human freedom. You know, there are movements for economic justice that don't involve a lot of human freedom, you know, that become authoritarian and totalitarian and say, this is the way everyone has to be in order for the world to be just. At the same time, there are movements uh, for human freedom that don't involve a lot of justice, that say, okay, everybody do whatever you want. And if some people end up on the street, if some people end up hungry, uh, if a lot of people end up hungry, that's the consequences of freedom. Both Catholic social teaching and the cooperative movement insist that those things need to be held together, social justice and human flourishing and human freedom. Eastern Nova Scotia in the 1920s and 30s, two Roman Catholic priests, Fathers Jimmy Tompkins and Moses Cody, understood the convergence of Catholic social teaching and the values of cooperativism. This silent film, entitled The Lord Helps Those Who Help Each Other, financed in 1939 by the Harmon Foundation of New York, serves as an eyewitness account of the conditions that Fathers Tompkins and Cody worked to change for the common good. The local economy was based on natural resources and extraction, namely coal mining, fishing, farming, and Nova Scotians throughout eastern Nova Scotia were living in dire poverty. Since both men had returned from study in Rome with doctorates, the people referred to them then and to this day as Dr. Tompkins and Dr. Cody. There is no doubt that both Tompkins and Cody, who had studied in Rome, would have been influenced by the emergence of Catholic social teaching, begun with Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum, published in 1891. Today, the campus of St. Francis Xavier University is very different from the 1920s, when in the dead of winter, Father Jimmy Tompkins initiated adult education courses for people involved in farming. These courses came to be known as the People's Schools, no doubt influenced by the pamphlets seen here written by Father Tompkins and used in these adult education programs. Both Jimmy Tompkins, who is credited as Moses Cody's mentor, and Moses Cody himself, were parish priests, and their parish work involved sacramental ministry, but also involved their commitment to Catholic social teaching, as described by Sister Claudette Gallant, a sister of St. Martha of Antigonish. They were so strong in educating the people in the social doctrines of the church, but also of, of the social justice aspect. Can you tell me who? You didn't... Oh, Dr. Cody and Jimmy Tompkins, Dr. Jimmy Tompkins, that if one of the men or women or whoever went to confession, their penance was not three Hail Marys like they give them today or three Glory Be the Fathers. It was to go and read a section so-and-so in the social doctrines of the church in order to educate them. And what a wonderful way, you know, the last number of years, those you, you didn't even know there were any such things as social doctrines. They were, they were left on the shelf. In those days, they were used to their advantage to educate the people. St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, established an extension department in 1928, and Dr. Cody was its first director. It was here that the Antigonish movement began, with the establishment of study clubs composed of miners, fish harvesters, steel mill workers, and farmers. 
These study clubs would meet in kitchens and at dining room tables, aided by pamphlets like these, created by staff at the Extension Department, and aided by field workers who assisted in the discussions. Ida Delaney, seen here in the armchair, in her book, By Their Own Hands, records the first questions posed during the study clubs. Why are we so poor? Why can't we make the farm pay? And why are we always in debt? It was in the study clubs that people learned about credit unions and the cooperative enterprise, and the result was the establishment of credit unions and consumer and producer co-ops across eastern Nova Scotia. Atlantic Credit Unions, with assets of $8.5 billion, which today serves almost 300,000 members in the four Atlantic provinces, traces its roots back to the Antigonish movement and the study clubs established by the Extension Department of St. of X as it's known today. The Sisters of St. Martha of Antigonish, a congregation of women religious founded in 1900 to serve a household management mission at St. Francis Xavier University, became enthusiastically involved in the Antigonish movement. In 1931, Sister Marie Michael McKinnon joined the staff of the Extension Department and was tasked with the development of a women's program. As a trained home economist, Sister Marie Michael began to engage the women in the rural areas with courses in nutrition and management of household budgets and using their skills on the loom, as seen here, to create woolen goods for sale to increase their household income. Sister Marie Michael was later joined by Sister Irene Doyle, and together they created learning material with thought-provoking titles like The Fat of the Land, the farm should feed the family. What can women do? And the woman speaks her mind. For these two sisters, working with Dr. Cody was a challenge, as Sister Teresa Parker reflects on their groundbreaking adult education work. Because uh, most likely they went to uh, St. of X because both of them had home economics, and that was the thing that uh, Cody was so anxious for they, them to have groups that would work with the women in, the, in Antigonish County, in Pictou County. He, Dr. Cody left them on their own and it was up to their own creativity to develop uh, these workshops and these study groups with women. It's not by accident that, you know, our early days, our pioneering uh, ministry was as homemakers, the domestic work at the university, but it's beyond that. It's the, it's the creating of home, um, and that you can expand that to many layers. You know, environmental work is about creating home for earth, you know, taking care of that, of our common home. But for them, as home economists, they understood uh, the need for people to, for women in particular, to, to um, understand how to run a household. And I think the creativity that they had too, Irene was such a Renaissance woman, like so gifted in art and just the ability to write pamphlets. And, you know, they were the early um, infographics, <laughs> the pamphlets that they did. I just, I can't imagine what they would do in a computer age, truly. Women came to the program because it met their needs, and they became involved in the credit union and consumer cooperative system. Moses Cody once declared that if he had 50 Marthas, he could change the world. There would not have been an Antigonish movement without the Sisters of St. Martha in Antigonish. Um, part of that was uh, Cody's respect, Moses Cody's respect for the Marthas and, um, you know, insisting that they have, uh, you know, the freedom to, to do the work that they needed to do in the Diocese of Antigonish. Um, and part of that was the leadership within the Marthas really supporting uh, the Antigonish movement and the principles of adult education um, and committing their own time and resources to, to supporting that movement. Um, and I know that 
many sisters throughout, um, from, from the very beginning of the Anaganish movement, were right there on the ground in the communities, working with the people to, you know, do the adult, adult education work of, you know, basic literacy, but then also developing some of the consumer co-ops and producer co-ops and, and what ended up being credit unions. So I, they were there from the beginning and I think really were quite uh, essential to the success of the movement. Dr. Moses Cody died on July 28, 1959, and his casket was carried to his grave by two farmers, two fishermen, a miner, and a steelworker. My dad was the representative of the farmers at the at Cody's funeral, and then Sister Claudette, her dad represented the miners, and Sister Peter Claver's dad uh, represented the fishermen. And it, it was just, uh, you know, at, so that you know, you know that the three of us were really filled with this uh, whole thing of community and development. The Sisters of St. Martha were strategic partners in the Antigonish movement and to this day are benefactors of the Cody International Institute, which was established shortly after the death of Dr. Moses Cody, and in response to the hundreds of people from around the world who came to visit the Extension Department to learn about cooperativism. In the spirit of Moses Cody and the Sisters of St. Martha of Antigonish, the Cody International Institute serves the developing world with courses and educational resources, which are made available through this extraordinary library, which was set up by Sister Marie Michael, who retrained as a librarian as the Institute began in 1959. We asked Sister Joanna Regan whether Sisters Marie Michael and Irene Doyle could be described in modern terms as early feminists. I could describe them as that. They probably would never have used that language and never have thought of it, for sure. I think for me, framing it within social teaching and within their faith um, probably is more accurate in that the prime principle of social teaching is the dignity of the human person. And so for them, that would have been their motivation, the dignity of the human person. And if you're living out of that and working to ensure that the dignity of all people is recognized, um, then there's no room for inequality in that. So I think that's the better frame in the sense of their context as women religious, that it was about ensuring that uh, no one is left behind um, based in that principle of the primacy of the human person. Yeah. In an industrial valley in the Pyrenees in northern Spain is the Basque community of Mondragon, or Arasate in the Basque language. It is a remarkable example of the success of the cooperative enterprise. During the Spanish Civil War, this northern valley was attacked by Franco and the nationalist forces. This city square in Guernica, a Basque town not far from Mondragon, was bombed during that civil war. This punitive bombing campaign was made famous by this Picasso painting entitled simply Guernica. The town was subjected to three hours of aerial bombing. 30% of the population was killed. After the Second World War, with its industry smashed, the Basque people began rebuilding their valley communities, but with a unique approach. Father Jose Maria Arismendi Arieta, a parish priest who had been a prisoner of war in the Civil War, was assigned to serve in a parish in Mondragon and is credited with founding the now famous Mondragon Cooperative Movement. Father Arismendi Arieta's approach was first to begin with formation of social clubs for young Basque men and women and study of cooperative values before establishing credit unions or worker co-ops. His biographer, Fernando Molina, explains. The enterprise, the economic enterprises, the uh, economic companies that uh, were founded as Mondragon 
where the last part, the last uh, phase, the last uh, uh, step of a long step of a many steps, previous steps that uh, were uh, promoted to develop a general Catholic uh, activity uh, in in this uh, area of Mondragon and the little uh, towns surrounding it. So he wanted to promote firstly sports, leisure, education above all, and in the, the economical part, it was the last one. And this is this was founded in how Catholic social action was uh, understood by him and how he understood it. In his own words, Don Jose Maria Arismendi Arieta reflects on the nature of the cooperative enterprise. Cooperation is an authentic integration of people into the economic and social process, which shapes a new social order. Cooperators must collaborate in the pursuit of this end goal, joining forces with all those who hunger and thirst for justice in the world of work. Today, the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation is the 10th largest industrial group in Spain and a global benchmark in the co-op movement. Mondragon includes 240 businesses, of which 81 are cooperatives, with a combined workforce of 70,000 people. It has 12 research and development centers and its own university. By the early 20th century, there were two main threads that were starting to develop in Catholic social teaching in the major papal encyclicals and in the writings of theologians of the time that fed into the cooperative movement. One is the um, idea of distributing ownership, what came to be called in some contexts distributism. And this um, was a solution to the problem of labor and capital uh, by distributing ownership across society more broadly. The second is an idea of personalism, a kind of more intimate idea, less about political uh, economy and more about what is the value of the human person. And these ideas came together in really profound ways by the mid 20th century in the cooperative experiments that were um, spreading among Catholic communities at that time. Um, I think, you know, one of the great um, exponents of this synthesis is uh, Father Jose Maria Arismendi Arrieta, the founder of um, the Mondragon Cooperatives in the Basque region uh, of Spain. And um, he is very clear in his, his writings about how this project of, of business, an economic project, was also a spiritual project, um, that its goal was not merely um, or even principally uh, economic, but but humanistic and and in that humanistic in the sense of um, of the spirituality recognizing that the human uh, in in the Catholic vision is made in the image of God and that fulfilling the the full promise of what a human could be is a way of of recognizing and honoring that gift um, of divine life. All these people, all these young. Catholics who develop all these uh, companies that uh, are known as Mondragon in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s in in Spain, in the best country, they were very humble people, very, very humble. They didn't know many things to, to, to live. I mean, they have little apartments. I, I, I've known their apartments. They have lived in that apartment, in those, in, in those apartments, from the beginning of the, uh, when they make their families to the to the end of their lives, they have drove, they have driven little cars, very 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 uh, very smart and very uh, not expensive cars, and they did many many money, but all that money they made many money, but all that money they don't get for them. It was for the community, for the cooperative community, and in general for the local community, and they were very humble. And I think that the the the, the reason of it was religion. I mean, they 
they had faith. They had faith not just in God, but in, in, in the human being, in the, in the humans and uh, in humanity. And uh, they were humanist, uh, absolutely humanist. And uh, for me, uh, they are uh, people that we need to know in this time of uh, individualism, narcissism, hypercapitalism, and all the isms that are related with uh, prom promote only the person, one's, uh, one, one, uh, one self, and not commitment, and, and don't have a commitment with this, uh, the community in which uh, we are inserted. Harvey Steele, born in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, was a Scarborough missions priest who worked as a missionary in China until the Japanese invasion of 1938, when he was among a group of priests and sisters who narrowly escaped the advancing Japanese army. Unable to return to China after the Chinese communist government of Mao Zedong expelled all foreign missionaries, Harvey Steele returned to Nova Scotia, where he served in the Diocese of Antigonish and worked with Fathers Tompkins and Cody, the founders of the Antigonish movement. Talking about Harvey as um, someone who's a priest who was involved in the, in the co-op movement is to tell a story about many other priests, not only from Scarborough but from around Latin America, a lot of the co-ops, whether it's um, uh, in Central America or South America or the Caribbean. Um, they have founders or support anyways from, from the local priests. In the Dominican Republic, he established credit unions and worker co-ops among the campesinos or farmers of that Caribbean island. Known locally as Padre Pablo, he was very successful in establishing cooperatives. Father Harvey Steele was for a time parish priest like Jimmy Tompkins, Moses Cody, Don Jose Maria Arismendi Arieta, and this afforded him the opportunity to see firsthand how people in the Dominican Republic were exploited by unscrupulous sugar plantation owners and landlords. They also lived in a dictatorship run by Rafael Trujillo, dictator for life, and this would prove dangerous for Harvey Steele. Working to promote co-ops, which are inherently democratic, can bring you to the attention of the dictator. And dictators are suspicious of anything they cannot control. Here is an audio clip from an interview with Father Steele, where he reflects on how dangerous co-op work became in the Dominican Republic. I wanted to, make, uh, to wake them up. My talks were always in the shocking them. And of course, uh, they, a lot of them, they looked upon me, first of all, a foreigner, but then the label I had as a priest, uh, they did trust me on that score more than any, I certainly could never do it as a lay person. And they thought I was crazy, a lot of them, really, that years later they'd tell me they knew I, I was in danger, nobody would dare say the things I was saying. Of course, they couldn't say these things. And they went along with me when I was trying to tell them how they should build their own economy, their own social life and all. But in the back of their heads, they said, well, after all, he's a foreigner. He, he doesn't understand that the, this is just an impossible thing, you know, that sort of thing. Were you telling them outright to oppose Trujillo? No, I'd never say oppose Trujillo. I'd give the positive side of it. Because if I were to say that in the beginning, I wouldn't have lasted as long as I did. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd just avoid him, avoid government, just tell them how they are able, capable, if they want to, in the cooperative, what do you call it, to solve their own economic problems. And the only way to do it is through the cooperative efforts. Right. In 1959, Harvey Steele, after refusing to sign a letter falsely accusing him of threatening the life of the dictator, escaped to San Juan, Puerto Rico, where upon his arrival from the airport, he encountered a beggar who proved to be a potential assassin sent by Trujillo. In 1964, committed to spreading the good news about cooperative enterprises, Harvey Steele chose Panama in Central America as the location to found the Inter-American Cooperative Institute. At the ICI, close to 3,000 men and women from nearly 800 grassroots organizations across Latin America have studied the principles and values of cooperativism, influenced, no doubt, by the Antigonish movement and Catholic social teaching. 
Not unlike Tompkins and Cody in the 1930s and Arismendi Arieta in the 1950s, Harvey Steele was convinced that formation or education was the pathway to successful cooperativism. Tom Walsh, who served as the executive director of the ICI for seven years, explains. Harvey saw, because of his own hands-on experience in the Dominican Republic, that if you did not have good co-op leaders formed in values, in principles, in knowledge, yeah, that with all the experience they had, they would fall into the traps of managing wealth, managing people poorly, or corruption. You know, it was part of society. society. They were continually being pressured to be part of that corruption. Um, government person comes over and offers you to, you won't um, turn off your water, uh, won't give you some trouble because if you give them a bribe or, you know, whatever, right? Um, what do you do when, uh, when people are, you're picking up um, coffee and you're weighing it by the pound and you find the sack that has a five pound rock in it, you know? Um, why would members work against their own co-op, you know? That sort of thing. So uh, he saw it as fundamental that formation had to be a part and it had to be, and fortunately, he was, timing was good again. I mean, there was Paulo Freire, uh, there was Learn by Doing, there was all these different uh, strategies for, for learning, but, but also he gave importance to culture, people's culture. What are the values? Um, you know, the indigenous people have very strong values about honesty, uh, not cheating, no stealing, you know, respecting your neighbor, and highlighting those. Eh? One of the things you find when reading Harvey's um, major work, a uh, book he wrote in early 1970, uh, in the midst of, um, uh, in Panama, was the uh, book that's called Who Are the Owners of Latin America? It's an analysis of the repression and oppression that goes on. And he discusses in that book the value of the Antigonish movement to similar situations in Cape Breton and, um, and what it can mean, uh, as well as the Catholic social teaching, for the co-op movement in Latin America. Father Jim Webb was born in 1944 in Halifax and raised in Attaganish, Nova Scotia, attended St. Francis Xavier University and was ordained as a Jesuit in 1973. From 73 to 86, Jim lived in Toronto and was co-founder of a number of organizations committed to social justice. He was in the original collective that founded the Catholic New Times and was also co-founder of the Riverdale Community Health Centre and Riverdale Cooperative Houses. So at some point in the early 70s, there was a group of people in this neighbourhood that had been working in the neighbourhood on various other um, social justice activities, uh, neighborhood activities, that sort of thing. Um, one of them was Father Jim Webb, one was uh, Vicki Butterfield, who recently passed away, unfortunately. Um, and they became involved in housing through their other work um, because they had been contacted mostly by senior residents who were being hounded to sell their houses. Uh, they had a sense, a gut sense, that they were being underpriced. Um, and their other worry was that they had nowhere to go if they sold. But they also couldn't keep up with the repairs at that point. So this group of people, um, community activists, uh, formed a, a, a sort of collective, I guess, which I believe was called the um, Riverdale Housing Renewal Association, something like that. And so they began to form uh, a group of people that would help with minor repairs um, uh, with the aim of sort of helping these people remain in their homes as long as possible and not being forced to sell. I don't think it took them very long, um, probably a couple of years, to realize that, that that was not anywhere near enough to solve the problem. The problem was much bigger than that. And so I don't know exactly how the idea of housing cooperative came up. It may have come up through Jim because uh, I know that the cooperative movement in Canada, its origins are in Antigonish. Um, so I don't know uh, exactly 
Uh, but I suspect Jim was one of the um, uh, pushers for that. From the, from the start, he he felt that we should uh, learn to minister in you know in the in a poor uh, part of town in a poor part of reality. So I think it was this. Uh, he didn't start out by by working on housing. He started out by us wanting to live and uh, work in in Riverdale. And uh, so he looked for the uh, issues that were of uh, greatest importance to the people and housing was one of them. So yes, he got involved, in, very involved in the uh, Riverdale Housing Co-op. And uh, in fact, uh, af long, long after he left and went to Jamaica, we actually sold our last house in Riverdale. We, we'd, had, we'd been in th three different locations but we sold the last one to the uh, co-op. Jim was committed to the idea of the cooperative enterprise, and as a Jesuit, he was committed to social justice. Cardinal Cherney, who had lived with Jim in Riverdale, reflects on Jim's motivation. I'm, I'm quite sure it came from, from his appreciation for Catholic social teaching, but probably the most uh, important influence on him was uh, was the Cody Institute in Antigonish. Uh, he, he had, in a certain sense, he had grown up, uh, lived in, breathing the spirit and uh, basic ideas of the Cody. And I think that's what uh, really, that was the, um, the basic, let's say, source of his ideas and his uh, orientation and his motivation. That accomplishment to me is a tremendous one especially now that we're going to be 50 years old. We own 25 properties in the neighborhood, which we have kept out of the hands of private landlords, which I'm quite proud of. Um, and uh, we're thriving. And I, I really, I wish Jim could sort of see where we're, where we are now and what he, what he helped begin, because it's huge. It's made such an impact, I think, in this neighborhood. Um, so, in among recent popes, John Paul II and and Benedict um, the Sixteenth and and Pope Francis, you see these regular addresses that they give to um, uh, to Italian credit unions, for instance, and Italian cooperatives, in which they make much more explicit than their predecessors did uh, the connection between Catholic social teaching and these forms of economic activity, and. Um, you know that that you know, connection, I think, was recognized long before those popes made it even more explicit. It was recognized among um, priests and and lay people um, trying to solve practical problems in their communities, in their in their worlds, using cooperative methods. Um, but much more recently, the the connection has become more and more explicit at the highest levels of the church. You know, I had the most wonderful experience in 2012, which was the International Year of Cooperatives, of being invited to the Vatican by Pope Francis uh, to come and talk to him about what cooperatives were doing around the world to fight poverty. And during that session, um, I was asked to introduce it, which I did, and um, told him about some of the initiatives that were going on around the world. And um, he, when he came, when I finished, he said to me, you know, Mrs. Green, when I was a little boy, my father took me and my three brothers and he sat us down and he talked to us about cooperatives. And I've never forgotten it. And uh, we were all very moved by his understanding of cooperation, um, by the way he talked about it and, th th and that he said it was, it was so important because it was a whole different way to approach the economy. It wasn't about greed, it was about meeting the needs of the people, all the things that as cooperators we talk about all the time. This is a man who understood it. We began this journey into cooperativism with a brief look at Laudato Si on care for our common home, Pope Francis's encyclical published in 2015. Pope Francis in this encyclical encourages cooperation and the cooperative as an option that is inspired by the social teaching of the church. The evolution of Catholic social teaching from Pope Leo XIII in 1891 to Pope Francis has encouraged an alternative to unbridled market-driven enterprises and the culture of waste. 
Pope Francis often explains his personal interest in cooperatives. Grazie. The faith leaders we have visited in this film represent cooperative founders of many faiths and founders of no particular faith traditions. The cooperative movement across the globe has many sources of inspiration, but they are all united in their commitment to democracy, concern for the common good, and care for our common home.